welcome to worship at New Hope United Methodist Church of Enid, Oklahoma. So we're doing a sermon series right now on gratitude, uh, because right now is the season for gratitude, the, the Thanksgiving season. I, I know that, that many of the stores here in town and probably throughout the country have already started uh, playing Christmas music, which I take a little bit of offense to. I think that, that Christmas music should be for after Thanksgiving. I mean, if you're already in the Christmas spirit, don't let me quash it. Um, but I find that having a little bit of time set aside uh, during this, this season of, of harvest and of, of transition um, into this Thanksgiving holiday, uh, that we set some time aside for gratitude um, as a benefit for us um, in a actual literal way um, in our daily lives um, and for our spirits. Now, unfortunately, during this part of this sermon series on gratitude, um, we're going to be talking about money. I know that, that this is never fun, um, and you know, I don't always uh, think that pastors enjoy to talk about money very much, um, but it's important because money and giving and generosity and, in fact, gratitude are all related. I think I said in an earlier sermon that giving begins in gratitude, and I hold by that to this day. So let's hear the words from our scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 22. But we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and have charge of you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, beloved, to admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, if I'm really honest with myself, <laughs> I don't think I've ever enjoyed hearing a sermon on money. I've never enjoyed hearing a sermon on giving or stewardship, um, and it, I think, it happens to be my least favorite topic, just in, in general, to to hear people talk about. And I, I think that's because most sermons on on money are, are often filled with with moralizing and guilting, and I mean sometimes just flat out bad theology. And and I've actually had multiple times the the misfortune of going to a church for the first time during the time where they have decided to to talk about money and give, giving and and just feeling so guilted um, and so so shamed uh, in that sermon that that I just never went back to that church um, <laughs> so if you are worshiping with us for the first time here online um, I'm sorry I mean, I'm glad you're here, and I, I hope you'll come back. Um, but money, ultimately, while it's not fun to talk about or hear about, I find it very important. You know, one of the reasons why I think that sermons on money are often so cringe-inducing is because I don't think that pastors actually like to talk about it any more than most people like to hear about it. Um, I think that discomfort comes across in the message that we say. Um, and so what I've tried to do today, um, <laughs> a gift to myself as much as, as to you, is to actually preach a sermon on money um, that I can get behind and that I can actually uh, enjoy, maybe get even a little bit excited about. Um, and as a final note, um, while being a pastor is probably the most relevant um, perspective that I bring to this. Um, I also bring the perspective 
um, as a person who majored in economics and has some experience in, experience in banking, finance, and accounting. Um, and I think that this encourages me to think big picture. Giving doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's part of our overall spiritual health regarding all of our finances. Um, and so imagine my surprise when I found out that John Wesley, the, the founder of the Methodist movement in, in Britain and America, uh, actually preached a sermon on the entirety of the financial life called the use of money. And in this, uh, much like Methodists have three simple rules for living, do no harm, do good, um, and attend upon the ordinances of God, uh, which we usually just paraphrase as love God or grow in love with God. Much like we have those three simple rules for living, John Wesley also gave us three simple rules for our financial living, for good financial stewardship. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. For Wesley, and I think for all of us, these three simple rules ought to be a spiritual practice because the use of money is a spiritual matter. Just like um, it, Congress always talks about when they're setting the budget, that the budget reveals where your priorities are. A household budget reveals where our priorities are uh, as well. Um, and where our priorities are is where our heart is. And so by following these simple rules, we can all practice responsible giving and be better and more faithful stewards of our own financial gifts and resources. So first, earn all you can. It seems like a very reasonable rule. Um, it certainly seems uh, like it's not very far from the conventional wisdom uh, that we have in our society about giving. Um, and uh, about the use of money. Um, but if we look closer, we'll find that earn all you can has important caveats. The terms on which gain can be sought by Christians has to, by nature, has to exclude anything that can harm our own being in body, mind, or spirit. Um, and in this way, the first rule of earn all you can matches the first rule of do no harm. Wesley also excludes anything that harms our neighbor in any aspect by, by damaging her body, by failing to exercise due diligence in her protection, or by exploiting weaknesses of mind or failings of character. I think it's interesting to think about what modern occupations would pass John Wesley's test here and which ones would not. Wesley goes on to say that, that we may not harm our neighbor's substance. And so he rules out um, a lot of practices that in this modern day actually are the causes uh, by which many people have become extraordinarily wealthy. Things like predatory lending practices or profiteering from another's hardship. And also things that we think of as even more routine than that. He forbids selling goods below market value uh, for the purposes of driving others out of business. Um, and he lays it down as a principle that we can't do anything uh, that would cause, uh, can't do anything that would intentionally harm our neighbor's business um, in order to advance our own. We can't hire our neighbor's workers when, when he's in need of them. Um, and all of these things are, of course, contrary, in Wesley's mind, to Christian duty. We as Christians are to prosper in, in business or whatever our trade is uh, by sheer diligence, by ingenuity and excellence in the use of our various skills and, and the superior quality of our work. You know, just as our scripture today reads as an admonishment against being idle, Hard work to better ourselves um, and our families and also to better the world is spiritually important for us. Anything else violates the commandment to love your neighbor, um, on which hang all the law and the prophets. And of course, 
if we violate these rules, what do we gain if we gain the world and lose our souls? So Wesley's second rule about saving all one can um, is not just a plea for modesty or prudence in expenditures. <laughs> it's really an attack on, on all of the consumer capitalist spending that fuels our economy um, and, and makes our society run in the way that it does. Um, legitimate expenses under Wesley's thinking can include anything that, need, that is actually needed to provide basic sustenance for yourself or your dependents. Um, but he really puts the emphasis here on the word basic, basic sustenance. Um, one can, in good conscious, conscience, spend enough to support bodily health and strength. Um, you can invest in your business. You can invest in education um, in order to advance a future good. But Wesley argues against spending even a penny to provide such trivial benefits as, as mere variety or beauty in one's food, clothing, or surroundings. And he regards all of these things as luxuries. Uh, recently, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about what I have, the luxuries that I have, um, and what that represents um, in terms of my, my spiritual health and my spiritual life. I think that oftentimes some of these things can be, can be very good for us. We are meant to uh, have joy and experience nice things. Um, but when those things become uh, the object of our desire, they can become like little idols that take us away from God um, and God's call on our lives to love the less fortunate. According to Wesley, the resources that we devote to such luxuries, they're, they're not just merely wasted. Uh, he says that they are devoted to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And this is a phrase that he uses repeatedly uh, to sweep up whatever is desired without being strictly needed for life. And he results in a, a standard for what may be innocently spent, and that is not much beyond what is needed for bare necessity. And he says that whatever is left over is strictly owed to the poor. And the weight of Wesley's biblical interpretation here falls on the identification of unnecessary purchases with the love of the world and the, and the things that are of the world being at odd with the love of God. It's hard to imagine what Wesley would make of our modern culture of consumption or the degree to which the contemporary church has accommodated it. Now, finally, the critical point of Wesley's sermon is rule three, give all you can. The whole purpose of earning and saving is that you can actually give all you can to support the most basic needs of those who lack their own means for health and safety. Wesley insists that, that such giving is not a matter of charity as much as it's a matter of duty. When we use our resources to indulge our desires instead of meeting the needs of the poor, we don't only miss an opportunity to do good. Wesley says that we rob God because we take what God has entrusted to our administration, what God has given us, and turn it from the purpose for which God has given it. Uh, so despite its reputation as the most accommodating treatments, uh, that Wesley gives of wealth. Uh, to, to take Wesley's sermon, The Use of Money, seriously, I think would require a whole new way about thinking at, about the way that we earn and use money in a world in which many people have their basic needs go unmet every single day. So, how do we live by Wesley's rules? Well, the United Methodist Church offers four basic steps uh, that can help us to become more faithful stewards of our financial resources. 
The first step is understand your finances. You know, it often surprises me uh, just how often people don't know their household budget. Now, I was in that boat a couple of months ago um, because it when you move to a new place and income changes, all of that stuff, uh, expenses change, it does take a while to, to actually get into a budget that works. But many people have no idea what their actual income is or how much they're spending or even how much debt that they have. Um, and understanding your finances means knowing your household income and creating a budget of monthly and annual and annual expenses and taking an inventory of your debts. These things um, really help us to understand how we're spending, what we're spending it on, and then we can take a look at are we actually spending thing, spending money on things that are good for us and good for others. The second step is engage spiritually. Learn and pray about God's desire for our stewardship of our resources. Pray about your level of giving and add that money, add that amount to your monthly expenses. Step three is make changes. This means live within your means. Countercultural indeed. Resist the social pressure to spend and buy more. And I think that this may be the hardest thing to do in our modern society. Our modern society says, uh, spend, 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 consume, consume, consume. And I think that the, the Christian way of life lends itself to a much more radical simplicity in, exp in expenditures. Um, a radically simple life is nothing to be ashamed about. Um, and I think from a spiritual perspective, it's something to be um, uh, celebrated um, and, and lived into. One way that we can, can help ourselves to do this is to be good stewards of the things that we already have. And we can do this by following another set of three rules, uh, which are known as the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, when we do that, we are not only helping ourselves to consume less um, and therefore to save more, um, but we are also helping the earth um, and those who live on the earth, which is all of us, uh, to have a planet that is less polluted um, and has more of its resources to be able to, to offer. And umcgiving.org stresses that it is totally okay it's a good thing to ask for help if you're having trouble making or keeping your budget. And I will say here um, that because I do have a lot of experience in um, making and keeping to a budget, it doesn't always work out, but we try very hard. Um, because I do have a lot of experience in that, um, if you are having trouble making or keeping a budget, uh, if you don't know where to start, I've got resources and, and I'd be happy uh, to offer my, my personal expertise in that. Um, so just send me an email and um, I would, I'll, I'll get back to you and we can, we can start that process of, of uh, helping your financial health. And step four is give generously. Pledge and contribute regularly. And, you know, I know that it is already basically the end of the year, um, but if you can, if you can help it, don't leave all of the giving uh, to the end of the year. Give of your time and money to support your local community um, and consider additional contributions as you're able for things like global initiatives for mission, witness, and service. And I know that all of this, all of this seems like so much, but I think that for most people with the right supports and resources, small changes are all that it takes to, to give generously or to grow in our giving and to become more faithful stewards of the gifts that God has given us. Following in Christ's way of selfless giving, as we see in, in the example of Christ from scripture, is a great starting place. And so is bringing mindfulness to gratitude. Our scripture says today to give thanks in every situation. And I think, I think that this means that, that when we are poor or when we are rich, when we are earning, when we are saving, 
when we are giving, we have to remember that, that all that we have, our food, our shelter, our cash, even the breath in our lungs is a gift from God. Because giving begins in gratitude. And so as we turn gratitude and, and self-giving into financial stewardship, let John, John Wesley's rules be your guide. Let it be so. Amen.